The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Zidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. A cartoon in the New Yorker magazine featured two people standing in front of a church door. The doors of the church were open, and out through the doors, flying through the air, obviously ejected forcibly, went the pastor. And one person says to the other, you really must have stepped on some toes today. Well, as often the case with cartoons underneath the humor is a touch of realism. Because whenever the word of God is truly spoken, disturbance may be the result. This is something that the people of Israel learned. It's something Jeremiah must have, must have realized when he begged off the call to be a prophet in our first reading this morning. If you read on in Jeremiah, you discover where that call leads. Jeremiah is thrown into a cistern and he's left there to die because he suggested that his government should surrender to their enemies in order to be spared destruction. Amos was thrown out of the temple at Bethel and told to leave the country because the people didn't like what he had to say. And that disturbance when the word of God is spoken still happens today. We're reminded in our own times of heroic witnesses like Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany Martin Luther King Jr. here in the United States. Both were thrown into prison. Both died as the result of what they believed and preached. I'd say these people were in good company. Because after all, this is precisely the reception that Jesus found when he spoke for the first time in his local synagogue in Nazareth. If you were here last Sunday, you probably realized that today's gospel reading continues where last week's lesson leaves off. Jesus had just finished reading the great words of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he sat down, the customary position of the preacher at that time, and he said simply, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And Luke tells us in our lesson today, all spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. Now that's a preacher's dream. You preach one sentence, and the whole congregation is amazed. They're in awe. They even began to show a little hometown pride, saying, whoa, is this Joe and Mary's son? Grew up down the street? He could bring some notoriety to our little town. But the next sentence in the story seems like Jesus 
just intentionally eggs them on, trying to get them upset with him. For all practical purposes, he says, you want me to do miracles here like I did down in that town called Capernaum? No way am I going to do that. I'm not here to make you famous. I don't think you're going to like what this hometown boy has to say. And then he goes on to assert that the love of God is not just restricted to Israel. That love goes out to others. It's even extended to people who weren't Jews. And he illustrates this by going back in Jewish history to point out two times when God's love went beyond national and religious boundaries. Elijah went only to the widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon, which was clearly outside the country of Israel. Not only that, but Elisha cleansed Naaman of his leprosy. And Naaman was a Syrian and certainly not a Jew. And that's when the congregation gets angry. In fact, the text says they were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. Sure didn't take long for the attitude to change, did it? Because now this hometown boy was messing with their local and national and religious pride. We're the chosen people. Why are you performing miracles in all those other towns and you haven't even performed one here for us? It was an insult for Jesus to go to the outcast and the unacceptable people before he helped those in his own faith and country. Our Thursday morning Bible class is studying the Old Testament book of Jonah. And I asked the class on the first day, if you were to ask anyone on the street what the book of Jonah is about, what would they answer? And to a person, I think, they said the whale. Well, I pointed out to them that the big fish is only three verses of four whole chapters of the book of Jonah. The focus of the story is not the big fish, but it's rather on a reluctant prophet who is told by God to go to that foreign city, Nineveh, and get the people there to repent. And Jonah doesn't want to go. In fact, he runs away from God, not because he's afraid of those nasty Ninevites, but because he doesn't want God's love and forgiveness to be shown to anyone but his own people, and especially not those foreign Ninevites. His problem is that God is indiscriminate in the exercise of his grace and mercy, and he doesn't like it. It's important, I think, to take a careful look at this attitude in the light of our text today. Because it isn't just an ancient outlook. It's very much alive in the modern world today. It's part of our society, and yes, even a part of the thinking of many respectable church people. Most of our problem comes not because we deliberately set out to follow something evil, I don't think that's true at all, but because we fail to see that an outlook which has elements of good in it can also be turned into something evil. You see, it wasn't wrong for the people in the synagogue to have a high regard for their spiritual heritage. In fact, this high regard for heritage was something that Jesus shared with them. It was a noble heritage. It was greatly enriched by patriarchs and prophets and psalmists who were part of that heritage. And last week's text said Jesus was in the synagogue that day, as was his custom. He wanted to be there to share in that heritage. But it's when that pride turned into an exclusive thing that it became demonic. Forgetting that God's love and grace is for all people, it erected walls between human beings. And the same thing does happen today. I see it in the church when I hear people say, charity begins at home, you know. Let's take care of our own needs first before we help all those other people. A couple of my church-going friends and even one of my relatives forwards on to me some of the most inappropriate, spiteful, and hate-filled emails that you could possibly imagine. 
hate-filled toward Muslims in particular, also toward our president and toward people who are not white. For several years now, I've been asking him to stop. Those emails still keep coming. Of course, now as soon as I determine that it's one of those emails, I just delete it. Don't even read it. Some of the emails imply rather directly at times that God loves Christians and not Muslims, or even that he loves Republicans and not Democrats. And I happen to believe that those emails are dead wrong. And I say that because this text and others like it in scripture prove it to me. I certainly believe that God reveals himself and his love for us in a very unique and special way through the person of Jesus Christ. I just don't believe that's the only way that God reveals himself to us. Those emails also reflect the sinful belief that we as Americans or we as Christians are superior to everybody else in the world. The root of our sin, the root of the sin of the people in the synagogue and of us, when we think that we are the recipients of God's grace, is that we presume that we can control God problem is that we have the relationship backwards. We think God is ours, and we forget that we are God's. We think that we can determine where God's love is to be shown, and we consequently forget that God is sovereign, and we can't presume to control God. God showers down his love on whomever and wherever he wills, and he shows no preference for race or nation or creed. Robert Frost, in a poem entitled Mending Wall, saw clearly that God's intention is to break down the walls and open wide the boundaries that separate us. The poem concerns two New England neighboring farmers who each spring must replace the stones in their fences that have been dislodged by the winter freeze and the spring thaw. As Frost imagines him walking along, he writes, something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. As Christians, we may well change just one word in Frost's poem. It isn't something that doesn't love a wall. For the Christian, it's someone with a capital S. Someone who loved the world, loved the world so much that he gave his only son in order to build a world without walls. People of Nazareth didn't want to hear that from a hometown boy. But what this hometown boy wanted to give them and what he wants to give us is the gift of grace. Grace to understand that God's love embraces all people, breaking down all of our sinful divisions and leading us to know, in Paul's words, that there is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus.